Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we're officially standing room only, so that's great. They really should have put us in the bigger room. Uh, note for next time. Um, my name is Dan Applequist. I'm here uh, to, uh, with uh, my colleagues Ada and, and Diego. Um, um, we're going to give you a, an update on Samsung Internet uh, and what we're doing with the web platform. Um, so first of all, I noticed uh, this picture was actually taken of our, of our DevRel team uh, in uh, April, I think, of last year, something like that. I noticed I'm wearing the exact same outfit, so apparently I only have one outfit. Uh, so interesting. Okay. Um, so what are we going to do today? Um, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of what we do at Samsung Internet and what our philosophy is behind the product uh, and behind uh, the work of our team. Um, then we're going to hear about progressive web apps, next generation web apps, which includes progressive web apps, and we're going to learn about what that is, um, and a bunch of new web APIs that Samsung has been leading the market in um, putting into our, into our uh, browser. Um, and we're going to hear about the immersive web, uh, which we've also been featuring quite a lot at our booth and at the Code Lab, um, which you're definitely welcome to come visit. You can um, get a direct uh, access to these experts on immersive web at the Code Lab and go through our Code Lab um, tutorial. Um, and we're going to hear about some other APIs as well, such as internet, where the web connects with the Internet of Things. Um, so first of all, what is, what is Samsung Internet? Well, Samsung Internet is uh, Samsung's browser for Android uh, phones, not only for Samsung phones, but also for actually any Android phone. Uh, you can download Samsung Internet across any Android phone right now. Um, Samsung Internet is also a team uh, that takes the web philosophy uh, to its core. So we, are, we exercise openness, we exercise uh, open source, um, we engage in the web community. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do that. Um, so we're, uh, we're a browser that some of the features that we're incorporating into this browser are uh, Bluetooth, so for instance, access to web Bluetooth capabilities that we're going to hear about later. Um, immersive web, uh, where you can actually go into an immersive environment within the web browser. Uh, progressive web apps, this is a way to build applications uh, using web technologies that enable you to get an app-like experience purely within the browser and other kind of emerging APIs uh, that, we're, uh, that we're working with, such as web payment, um, such as web components, such as uh, some of the most exciting stuff that Ada is going to talk about as well. Um, we are built on top of the open source Chromium engine. Uh, so what developers can expect from Samsung Internet is very similar to what they can expect from Google Chrome or other Chromium-based browsers, such as Opera. Um, however, What's often not talked about is the fact that Samsung is the second largest open source contributor into Chromium. So we are not just participating by taking the Chromium platform and adapting it to our uh, phones like some other OEMs are doing. We're actually contributing a lot back into Chromium through uh, code contributions, through uh, committing, and through owning certain uh, APIs within the Chromium platform. So there's a really strong relationship there between Samsung Internet and Chromium. Um, which is uh, very much at the core of what we do and how, and how we work. Um, as I said, some of the other things that we're doing are we're plugging into Samsung Internet specific uh, functions and uh, capabilities that are where, where, sorry, where Samsung have a, a core strength. Um, so why are we doing immersive web? Because Samsung has platforms like the Gear VR. Um, we enable, uh, and we were one of the first browsers to enable a save to home screen function within the browser that allows you to save progressive web apps to the home screen. Um, we were actually the first major browser to ship that, fun that functionality. Uh, Chrome followed up uh, with their own implementation later. Um, we plug in to the biometrics um, that Samsung features on its handset. So we have uh, direct APIs that plug into those biometrics. And by the way, we're also using uh, those uh, those features to power our privacy mode. Um, I should mention that one of the, uh, one of the um, 
uh, kind of differentiators that we see for Samsung Internet when it compared to other browsers is privacy. User privacy is very important to us uh, within, within the team. Um, overall, worldwide, we have about 5.5% average mobile use. That's all mobile browsers. That's all mobile browsing. That's an incredibly high number um, when you consider uh, all the mobile browsing that happens in the world. Um, and we're as high as 18% in some, in some regions where there's extremely high Samsung uh, usage. We're the most used browser on all Samsung Galaxy devices, and we're actually the second largest uh, Android browser after Chrome if you take a look at our usage. Um, how are we leading in the web space? We're doing things like uh, new web features. Uh, we are, um, uh, we're trialing new web features. We're, we're innovating by putting new, uh, new web features first, so things like the progressive web apps uh, saved a home screen. We're also participating in web standards. All the people on this stage are participating in W3C web standards groups. Um, I co-chair a group called the Technical Architecture Group on W3C. Ada is co-chair of the uh, um, Immersive Web Working Group. Uh, Diego co-chaired a workshop on Immersive Web, and we've all been um, participating, kind of putting work back into the web standards. This is how the web gets built, um, through standards. We're doing a lot of cross-browser initiatives. I want to particularly call out the work that we're doing with Mozilla on Mozilla Developer Network, MDN. So if you're a web developer, you probably, probably visit MDN uh, a lot. Um, I sit on the MDN advisory board, uh, along with a representative from Microsoft, a representative from Google, um, and some other companies as well. Boku is another company that sits on that board. Uh, and the, the whole idea of that is to make MDN a cross-browser uh, resource. So we've been putting a lot of effort and energy into making sure that the docs that are on MDN are up to date, um, that the browser compat data that's there when you look up a new feature is up to date. Um, speaking of browser compat data, we also make sure that things like can I use are featuring uh, Samsung Internet uh, cor correctly, that HTML5test.com features all the information on the latest Samsung Internet browser, stuff like that. Uh, as I said, we are very keen on open source contributions, obviously Chromium, but also we contribute into open source projects that are frameworks or uh, libraries that help developers, such as A-Frame, which is a, a very popular um, uh, immersive web uh, framework. Um, and we're doing web developer engagement. Um, we have a developer uh, advocacy team. Uh, we ran our own a conference last year in San Jose called uh, Samsung Create. There's a lot of videos up there from our developers as well as other developer advocates from other companies that we featured at that conference. Um, we go out and we speak at conferences and events around the world. Um, we're also, we have a developer blog at samsunginter.net. Uh, we have a Twitter instance at Samsung Internet. Um, we're doing a lot of developer engagement and getting, um, working with developers at the grassroots uh, on a lot of these kinds of um, functionalities. Um, and we put, I should say, diversity and inclusion at the core of the work that we do. So we're very, very uh, focused on that particular element. Um, we're doing outreach and advocacy. We're doing tooling and support. We're doing community engagement. And we get really good feedback from the technical press. So, so thanks, Samsung Android's best mobile browser available to all. That's pretty cool, right, when we saw that. Uh, Samsung's mobile browser comes to Androids near you. So this, this, the, the, these were quotes that were that were um, specifically about the uh, the release of Android, uh, the release of Samsung Internet across all Android. Um, more importantly, our users love us, and we get really good feedback on the Play Store, but we also get really good feedback on social media about Samsung Internet um, and about. And we also get good feedback on social media about our developer advocacy uh, work. So we're really happy to be a core member of the web community as well as coming to you here at Samsung uh, Developer Conference and, and telling you about Samsung Internet and, and this work. Now, I'm going to hand over to uh, Diego, who's going to tell you more about progressive web apps. Diego. Thank you, Dan. That was lovely. So. If we're talking about next generation web applications, then possibly PWA or progressive web apps is the most important development that we've seen in the past couple of years in this area. 
as web developers, uh, business owners in general, we want to have pleasant experiences. We want experiences or applications that have great interaction because this great interaction is pretty much going to lead into engagement. And this engagement is going to be the one that's going to keep our users coming back to our product. We want definitely to be able to have great discoverability because if our product is easy to find, then a lot of people are going to be using it. We also want to get this product and this experience in the hands of as many users as we can. And this generally means that we're going to be asking them to download something. If we're going to be asking them to download something, then it's very important to be thinking about the cost and the availability of users' data because depending on the data plan and depending on the country where the user is located, this can be quite expensive. So we really need to be mindful of these type of experiences. Um, and also related, uh, Size of users, storage. Not everyone is running the latest uh, mobile device, and uh, storage can be quite limiting in, on certain devices. So think about that most of the times we're asking a user to either install our application or have a family album. And I'm pretty sure that the one that uh, pretty much loses there is the application. So the way that we've been trying to tackle um, these experiences is generally with the traditional concept of an application. There are some, there are some um, quantitative traits on why this is the case. We can start thinking about usage patterns, and it is known that a user spends pretty much around 80% of its time when they are um, on their phone directly in an application. There's also a rise in mobile usage in comparison to desktop applications. Generally, if we think about an application, we think about the idea of something that has a great uh, user experience because it's fast, it's uh, uh, generally very snappy, and it's quite pleasant. Uh, you also have access to the device hardware and certain, certain functionalities like, for example, the file system. You get access to the camera. You get access to contacts and certain other things that are kind of like associated to the native experiences. You also have notifications, which are very important because these are a re-entry point uh, for users to come back into your experience. And finally, uh, the fact that the applications generally are going to work, even if you are offline or if you're in a Li-Fi um, environment where Let's face it, the majority of the world is still on 2G or 3G connections, so we need to be very mindful of all these type of things. So even though these are good things of an application, there are some challenges when we're thinking about how can we bring our product or our brand presence to different platforms. First of all, we can start thinking, OK, um, let's start developing in a certain language. This will target a certain platform. But we are leaving many other platforms uh, away and, and apart from, from our efforts. So we can start learning another language and another language and target another platform with another language. And in the end, you can see how this can get a bit more complicated. And this is one of the benefits that we're going to be getting with web technology. So then you can start thinking, OK, you can hire an agency. You can hire certain developers. And then you would see how the cost will pretty much start increasing. And even if you decide to tackle uh, the building an application and you go through with it, you're not getting necessarily the results that you were promised. Approximately 50% of the users uh, download zero apps per month, and I actually want to uh, get this question to your minds. How many apps have you downloaded recently? I'm pretty sure there are not that many. Also, it is known that users will delete an application, or they just won't download it if it's too big. Ironically enough, here we have the, sizes, uh, the average size for an Android and an iOS application. Um, if they need more storage space, don't doubt that users will uninstall the application. And ironically, they will go back to the browser where they can find the services for the products that they were looking in the first place. So this is where we can start asking, is there a way that we can combine uh, all the benefits from the web with the cool things that we saw from apps and the concept hence of a progressive web app? Because there is definitely a better way that we can be doing this. Um, think about having the reach of the web, which is three times bigger than the reach of native apps, with the offline functionality of an app. Think about, as well, an application that is written using web technologies, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, you can even hide the Chrome of the browser if you wanted to just make it look like a traditional native application. Think about how many web developers are already invested in the platform. Um, if you take a look, for example, at Stack Overflow and how 
their survey for the latest trends. Uh, these are the technologies that are constantly coming in first place. And actually, this is the sixth year in a row that we're getting these results. And uh, more importantly, that they are small downloads and that they can be saved to the home screen. And once you have an icon with uh, the name of an application in your home screen, the user for the user is exactly the same if it's built on web technologies or if it's built on native technologies. As long as it works offline and it has all the benefits of both worlds, then it's pretty much a uh, done deal. Additionally, because we're using the web platform, then we do get access to a lot of different capabilities that are built into the, into the phones and devices. Uh, think about probably the most prominent uh, camera, audio, data storage, access to the file system, and GPS and location. Think what you can build on the web as an application if you have all of this. Um, one that I'm actually very excited and the data is going to be speaking about, also immersive web. How can you build AR and VR that works offline as a progressive web app from your phone? Now, if we want to get this working, if we really want to start building progressive web apps, it's, it's um, a certain modifications that we need to do in the website. We need to make sure, first of all, that it's uh, compliant with progressive enhancement because it should work regardless of which browser or device you're uh, seeing the content. It should be responsive, hence it should adapt to any screen that you are um, developing for. But then again, this is something that we are already used to doing by now. It should be served over a secure connection, so think HTTPS. And the last two points are probably the ones that we would think about when we're thinking about creating a PWA or adapting an existing website into a PWA, which are pretty much, it has to have a web app manifest and it ha has to use a service worker. So now we are going to dive a bit deeper into uh, the concept of the web manifest and the service worker. So what's a web app manifest? It's pretty much a JSON file. It provides uh, the metadata about an application, and it's going to be the one that defines how the icon and the PWA looks once it's installed on the phone. So the way that this looks is uh, something similar to this one over here. You can see among different things, um, and uh, some of those things as the, the indentation in this file is just horrible, I'm sorry about this. But you can see that we have a short name, which is the name that's going to appear once this is installed in the home screen. You can see the uh, URLs to the icons that are going to be used in the home screen again. Um, down you can see display standalone. This means that we're actually removing the, the browser UI, so it's going to look like like an application which you can define all the interaction in the UI yourself. Orientation, if you want it to be logged to portrait or landscape or just work both ways. And you can even define theme colors, background colors, and all of this is going to be adapted by the browser and the loading the splash screens when, when the PWAs are loading themselves. So if we move to the other side, we have a service worker. So a service worker is kind of like a special type of web worker. Um, it's pretty much the one that's going to be responsible for intercepting network requests. It's going to be the one that's going to allow us to do offlining because we can cache resource and, re and retrieve uh, these resources as well. And it's going to be the one that's, help, uh, that's going to be helping us to deliver push notifications. So the way that we would be using this is first, we're going to be checking for support, um, which, uh, spoiler alert, it is actually quite a good support uh, right now. We're going to register the worker, install, and activate. Related to this topic is uh, push notifications, and we actually wanted to make an emphasis on this one because it's something that we know that's very important for developers. It's the way that you can keep the users coming back to your experience. Just um, make sure that you're using notifications on the web in a responsible way. We don't want another uh, notification or pop-up that's coming up asking for any permission the first time that you are logging into a website. Just be responsible with these uh, superpowers that the web platform is giving you. If you want some resources on, on how to set up a PWA, you can think about Lighthouse. This is uh, built into the Audit um, tab in Chrome Inspector. You can use WebHint as well, and it's a project that we've uh, been actually collaborating with a uh, colleague, uh, Peter. And uh, you can even start with the boilerplates that come from the PWA uh, builder. As I spoiled earlier, support for PWAs, you can see that across all major browsers, it is supported, so it's, uh, it's safe to, to start using it, and we've already been seeing uh, big brands like Twitter, for example, that have been adopting uh, these type of technologies, not only for uh, their web uh, applications, but also for, for example, the uh, 
Twitter application now in Windows, which is a, a PWA. We've actually been collaborating as well with certain partners uh, and in innovating uh, with the PWA experience itself. And if you want to read some cool uh, data and stats about how PWAs are actually making a difference for developers in all types of companies, then I would recommend the website PWA Stats. There you can see how you're even getting certain big websites to load on 3G connections in a very fast time. So this is all that I'm going to be speaking about PWAs, and I'm going to hand over to the magnificent Ada, which is going to introduce some very cool new web APIs. Now I have the fun bit of talking about some of my favorite things that are coming into the web platform today. So these new web APIs are, are APIs which um, are really changing the way that we approach web development. So web development today is built on three technologies, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. But they're changing and becoming even more powerful. So web components allows us to define our own HTML elements. So if you're ever feeling restricted by HTML, you can start creating your own elements to have all kinds of powers, which are powered by JavaScript. Speaking of JavaScript, we are now able to use JavaScript imports to, to dynamically pull in scripts when we need them, or to, only, um, or to build our web apps with, with small pieces of JavaScript, which we can pull in dynamically without having to build them on the server side. CSS has had the biggest changes over the past couple of years. It's come on leaps and bounds. Two properties I'm going to talk about today are the two that are most exciting to me, are CSS Grid and custom CSS properties. I pretty much just picked these four APIs because they're the ones I love the most, but there's been loads of other huge improvements. Um, and I can't wait to tell you more about them. Everything I'm talking about today works in Samsung Internet Beta. You can open up the Play Store now and, and find it and download it. Oh, wait. <laughs> OK, you can do it later. That's fine. Um, so let's get straight in with custom CSS properties. So this is what they look like. Um, the requirement is that you put two dashes before the name. So here I've defined color cyan to be a particular hex code. And I'm using it um, in this paragraph tag. Um, so by using var brackets dash dash color cyan. So you can think of this a bit like having a variables in your, um, in your CSS, which is pretty cool, but it's, it's nothing magic. We've been, we've had uh, variables in our CSS through our CSS preprocessors for a long time. But here's something you can't do with the CSS preprocessor. You can use CSS variables and calc functions. Because it's done live in the browser, it knows how big an M is in comparison to pixels, so it can add them together. And you can do maths live in the browser in your CSS file. And this is where it gets really cool. So one of the major powers of CSS is the cascade, the ability for properties to inherit values from their parents um, and to change them for all the children elements. So here in the root of my document, I've set padding to five pixels. And in the main, I've changed it to three pixels. So in this case, paragraphs um, in the main will, have, will receive the padding variable of three pixels. And if they're not in the main, if they're just a child of the root, then they'll get a padding of five pixels, which they can then use for whatever they like. So here I'm using like the padding to calculate the margin. And this raises some really interesting patterns. So one of the things we most often use CSS for is responsive design. So here I'm. Um, Use, I'm changing the padding on large screens to be 30 pixels. So on mobile, it's five. And then on um, large screens, it's, eight, it's 30 pixels. But the nice thing about this is that when we, um, um, when we as developers start only putting um, 
custom CSS custom properties into our media queries, the developers who come after us know what we're changing, because they can be like, ah, I see you're changing the padding here, and then I can use that padding prop, um, custom property throughout my document, so it becomes extremely explicit what's changing, making it much more convenient for future developers, or even myself in the future, to realize what I've done and why I've done it. Now I'm gonna talk about CSS Grid. So CSS Grid is an incredibly powerful 2D layout framework that's built into the browser. So if nothing else, you can immediately slash like 250K off your, um, off your CSS builds by not including Bootstrap or whatever grid framework you're using. Because this is really, really powerful and it's built into the browser. Uh, this URL here is, um, is an article written by my colleague Jo. Um, and she, she wrote a guide for building popular layouts um, using CSS Grid, which are responsively designed and, um, and have fallbacks for browsers that don't yet support CSS Grid. So the power of the grid comes from, um, um, comes from that it makes us rethink about how we do layout in the web. Because traditionally, layout in the web has been a total hack. We, we tweak our individual elements with the hope that when they've all put together in the whole document, that will look the way we intended. But CSS Grid allows us to think about the layout first, and then we put elements into the grid. So that if this is the way you write CSS, where you're constantly tweaking it, trying to get it to write, if you're constantly finding elements keep falling onto the next line, um, or something gets too big and gets pushed out the side of the box, CSS Grid is your savior. It's exactly the way um, to start thinking about layouts. Um, and if you think it's going to be, layout's going to be a scary thing, and you set aside like a full day to do a layout, you might find that CSS Grid allows you to design a very um, engaging layout in only a few minutes. Next, I'm going to talk about web components. So this allows you to define your own HTML elements. So for example, magic-widget, fancy-chart, best-button. So what these all have in common is that you have to have a dash in the name. Of course, you can be boring and be like, my company dash button, my company dash chart, my company dash widget. But have fun. Call it something fun if you want. But do what you like. They're cool. They allow you to write some, HTML, write some JavaScript and hook it, tie it into hooks into your HTML document. So as the element gets added to the page, it runs some JavaScript. As a tribute gets changed, it runs some JavaScript. This allows you to define your own HTML elements that can work exactly like native ones, and you don't need to worry about it. So you end up building these little Lego blocks of functionality in HTML, which you can slot together. And because it's just HTML, you can use it with any framework, a client-side one like React or Angular, or a server-side one like WordPress or something. Um, if you're already running a framework, because it's just HTML, you can get little bits of logic, encapsulate them in a web component, and start using it in your framework that's generating your HTML. This is incredibly powerful. And the pattern I really, really like is that if you combine um, web components with CSS Grid, or CSS Grid gets rid of all the HTML layout you're using to sorry, get rid of all the HTML elements you were using just to hack in some layout. So um, it all becomes incredibly declarative. Web Components allows you to hide all the HTML elements which were just used to build up your components. So put together, you can, have a, you can ship a single HTML document that contains the entire state of your web app in a human-readable format without relying on external JSON files which is incredibly powerful, and I'm really hoping it's going to be a new way we start seeing developers build websites. So next, I'm going to talk about um, JavaScript modules. So if you're building these big modern web apps like we're building today, like who's here is working on like big web apps? A few of you. Okay, cool. 
Um, so you've probably encountered your JavaScript bundles for your apps might be like megabytes in size, which works great on your work computer, but is a disaster for people on mobile networks who are really struggling to download your site and actually engage with it. Because on a low-powered device, um, a, like a, a large JavaScript file, like once it's expanded into like six or seven megabytes, might up to take up to 10 seconds just to parse the file, let alone downloading it and um, actually like running it. So um, by breaking our JavaScript file up to using it when we need it, it can, um, it can really simplify both our build processes and make it much easier for our users to engage with our content. So this is what it looks like. So I'm using script and I've added type equals module. This tells the browser that, it could, that um, there are scripts that need to be imported before it can run it. So it's um, importing the, um, um, the index page from my widget which might also import um, further JavaScript files in there. And it's importing a slide from some other slide deck software. And then I, can start, then I can use the slide variable in my code. So when the browser nav um, pulls down this code, it will pull down the entire tree with it. Or you might be like, whoa, that's, that's gonna be tons of network connections. That's gonna be really slow. But if you're delivering your site with HTTP2, then it's okay to make lots of connections to your server. It's extremely cheap nowadays, and it can download them all in parallel, something you can't do when you're downloading one giant JavaScript file. The other cool thing you can do if you're exceptionally clever is that if you can predict what, you, what files the user is gonna be needing, you can push them down to the browser using HTTP2 push, or prefetch them using prefetch in order to make sure they're already there and ready to go when the user needs them. You can also import um, JavaScript libraries dynamically. So the import uh, method, um, so at the top I'm just using the same import as before, but in this if statement I'm detecting whether the web animation API is available in this browser. And in the case that it's not, I'm using this import method to pull down a web animation polyfill. So I don't end up shipping like a large polyfill with my entire bundle for every user when most users probably won't require it. And the nice thing about it is that import methods are just a promise. Um, so I can import it and then I can wait for the promise to finish using dot then. And if you're using the really latest JavaScript code, which again, this, even this code works in Samsung Internet Beta, you can use um, the new um, async await abilities of JavaScript. So async await allows you to await promises to resolve. So here I'm awaiting the import of my polyfill before I'm running the code. This lets me write code that looks synchronous yet behaves asynchronously, making it extremely easy for developers to approach it and read it, um, and it makes a lot more sense for them. So, uh, I'm now going to move on to a different topic. This is a topic that's extremely close to my heart, which is the immersive web. So I'm co-chair of the immersive web working group. So if you want to know more in the W3C, so if you want to know more about what's happening in the immersive web and how it's coming to browsers, please come find me afterwards. I'll be at the, um, the code lab, and I'm more than happy to help chat to you about the immersive web. So the reason we're interested in this at Samsung is that we have a virtual reality web browser. So this is Samsung Internet for Gear VR. It has a URL bar and favorites and interacts with, um, um, with the regular Samsung Internet. And you can open up um, WebGL demos in it and do virtual reality in it. So I'll show you this demo in a sec. Um, so Samsung Internet for Gear VR is another browser you can download from the Oculus Store. I can see most of you don't have a Gear VR on you right now, so I won't ask you to download it right now. Um, but yeah, this is in the browser. So on the previous page, once the page loaded, the user presses the Enter VR button. And it puts the user inside the virtual reality experience. So this is recorded straight from the Gear VR. 
um, and they can look around and interact with it using the Gear VR controller um, and engage with and be fully immersed in this virtual reality content, which is incredibly cool and an amazing way to engage with users. So how does WebXR work? Well, here's like a simple overview. Um, I'm not gonna go into huge details because the API is changing, um, but hopefully we'll see people building VR websites in a few years. Not in a few years, in a few months even, like uh, middle of next year sometime. Like it should start settling down a bit more. Um, so we get the device position from the headset. So it's position and rotation. So we know where the user is in the real world. We present, change the position of our virtual camera to match the user's head position, and then we render what it looks like from the user's perspective. We then send this rendered frame to the headset, which then displays it to the user, and it really cleverly automatically does the lens distortion, and it, and it compensates for any lag, um, so the user always gets a consistently good experience, which is incredibly handy if you've been um, um, if you've done VR development before, this is like some of the tricky problems to solve. But web VR is changing because um, uh, web VR initially just focused on virtual reality. So web VR is now becoming web XR. So what is XR? So XR stands for cross reality. So it encounters virtual reality when the user is in a virtual world, which we're providing as developers, but it also includes augmented reality where, where virtual creations are brought into the real world. So what's the reason we're doing this? Well, when the WebVR APIs were first being put together, this was the hardware we had to, um, had to have to fuel our imagination. This is the Oculus DK2. It's an, it's an old but incredibly revolutionary VR headset. But the world's changed a lot since those days. So there's been Pokemon Go, which was an incredibly popular AR app. Who here has played it or played it at one point? Awesome. Um, yeah, um, <coughs> that makes me really happy. Um, but it's been fantastic for showing how a simple but engaging AR experience can capture the world. It's, it's magic. There's also um, a new hardware which changes the way we think about what it means to do immersive content. So this is the Microsoft HoloLens, and this is the Magic Leap One on the right. And these two headsets are both immersive augmented reality devices. So you put them on, and you can still see the real world around you, but virtual content will be placed in your periphery and in your, in your environment so you can walk up to it and engage with it. So when we were doing WebXR, this is what we were just looking at. This is the scope of, of what it was. It was just VR headsets. But now we're looking at doing um, VR just by moving your phone around like this because that's become a very popular pattern for when doing VR on the web, because it lets users engage with virtual reality content when they may not feel comfortable putting on a virtual reality headset. For example, on the bus, when you're gonna feel a bit embarrassed wearing a headset. It also encounters, uh, also allows for doing augmented reality in a similar fashion. So much like playing Pokemon Go, you can look through your phone and be like, ah, oh, there's a Pikachu on the floor and as well as the immersive mixed reality headsets, such as the, um, the HoloLens and the Magic Leap. All this work on the WebXR um, specifications are being done on the open on GitHub. Um, if your company is a member of the W3C, we would love to get you involved, and if you if you're want to know more about WebVR, or, or please uh, encounter me, or just read through the GitHub, see what kind of kinds of discussions we're having and see the problems we're trying to solve in bringing um, XR to the web for developers. This is just one of the things which Samsung is doing at the moment. So in this demo, um, which is in the browser, uh, we've placed a virtual uh, fox, but we're adding APIs to detect the ambient light. So when the ambient light changes in the room, the, the um, 
the virtual object gets um, the same light as well, um, making it feel a lot more as part of the environment. So it seems m much more real. Anyway, that's all I wanted to chat to you about. I'm going to hand you back to Diego to talk about the Internet of Things. Thank you, Ada. Five more minutes of fun. So Internet of Things. Um, I'm going to be very quick here because we just want to highlight some of the things, some of the technologies that are coming to the web platform that might be very relevant if you're interested in, in investing or developing these type of experiences. So Internet of Things, first of all, web Bluetooth, um, 5G, and I'm going to mention uh, 5G here because a couple of months ago in London, there was a web 5G workshop um, organized by the W3C, and it was quite interesting to see how it was we were trying to define and to see how can we communicate the application layer with the network layer and how can we take a better advantage of the network itself. Um, I think it's also quite interesting that IoT is one of the verticals uh, with which uh, 5G is being developed. Um, and the other technology that's coming to browsers as well is Web USB. Just uh, to mention a bit about Web Bluetooth, it's kind of like self-explanatory, but Web Bluetooth is already supported in Samsung Internet, and it's, uh, it's an API pretty much that allows us to connect to Bluetooth low-energy devices and control them through the browser. So think about controlling a drone through your browser, controlling uh, getting information from different type of sensors uh, like uh, heart rate sensors or any other uh, device, like for example, the Nordic 52 thingy that has uh, everything from a light sensor to a uh, gyroscope, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, pretty much there's this trend that the smartphone is becoming a control remote for the real world. And uh, it's actually good to see that we already have this support uh, from the browser. Something that's uh, another Technology. Uh, this was well. This is JerryScript. It's a lightweight JavaScript engine. It was developed uh, from scratch by uh, Samsung, the open source group, and um, it's quite interesting because it's actually developed uh, with the idea of it being embedded into kind of like different um, wearables. Uh, and actually, the Fitbit uh, Ionic is already in the market, and it's powered by JerryScript. So. Think about combining JerryScript with something like, for example, the Web of Things. Again, this is another W3C initiative. Um, and here, the idea is that we want to create, that, that they want to create a standard to reduce the fragmentation between different IoT platforms. It's interesting that it's, it's trying to provide different devices uh, with URLs so they can be linkable and discoverable, and all of this using web technologies. And if you actually combine Web of Things with JerryScript, then you can pretty much develop your own IoT uh, hub. And this is something that I believe also our, our colleagues in Samsung uh, Research United Kingdom are working on a lot of very cool demos about this. So I think we've given you a lot of information, uh, lots of new APIs. You know, at, at Samsung Internet, our market share is around 300 million active users. So. We just want to make sure that you are currently testing and the Samsung Internet platform, because if you're not, uh, be sure that your users are. Um, and we've given you an overview of a lot of new web APIs that are coming to the platform. Uh, so feel free to come experience the future of the web uh, with us here in Samsung Internet. I'd like to uh, thank you all very much for your attention and feel free to contact us. Feel free to come to our booth and have a chat with us to, with, about any of these APIs or anything else that's on your mind. Thank you very much.